Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Fantastic. Right, so, okay, so I'm from Tandem, and kind of want to, what I wanted to do is just start with a quote uh, with someone I love, I sort of have a, a small obsession about, um, and I want to start with this, in the sense that when you're a carpenter making a beautiful chest of drawers, you're not going to use a piece of plywood on the back, even though it faces the wall and nobody will ever see it. You'll know it's there, so you're going to use a beautiful piece of wood on the back. For you to sleep well at night, the aesthetic, the quality has to be carried all the way through. And as you can see, said by the, the late Steve Jobs. And for me, I see that, fr and that, that piece of wood at the very back is sort of where we're now transforming platform architecture and really giving it, although it's all, almost been like the hidden thing, um, and those teams, you know, scurry away and sort of make the best of that, it's now being brought up to the surface. And what I'm going to be talking about is sort of our journey to bring up to that to the top and where we are now. And we've done that over the period of two years. So who am I? So I'm Matt. I work for the platform team at Tandem. And I am an infrastructure architect. So I started off as a platform engineer. Um, and I'm now starting to transition into the architecture world. But that gives me an advantage with two hats, the BAU, the project work with the platform world, and also looking at the future. And I've been involved in a couple of phases of project work that we've been doing over the last two years. Um, but for me, it's all about delivering that customer experience, making sure that not just your external customers um, are getting the best out of your products, but also your internal users. And, and there's been a lot of chat um, especially earlier and what the other Matt was just talking about, it's making sure your engineers are on board and you're making progress and you're making developments. So I've been working at various different uh, technology firms. I started off at Citicus. Uh, I worked my way to Hostelbookers. And actually, Citicus, we were a very, very early SaaS service that dealt with risk. I, I, I couldn't understand it whatsoever, but I, we, we sort of deployed services that were shared. So it was sort of the very first thing that I saw from a SaaS provider. And then I went to Hostel Bookers. Uh, that was a, quite a big project. They had millions of customers. They were doing thousands of transactions and bookings a day. And then where I started to see um, you know, cloud really coming into the fore, just giving. Um, if you're based in the UK and you've done fundraising, you probably know who they are. They do 500 million pounds worth of donations every year, you know, spreading that out to um, to the charities who have signed up to that platform. So if you run a marathon, you probably know who they are. And that was an exciting time because social media was really kicking in. And then I ended up at Huddle. Um, if you worked in big e-commerce organizations, uh, it's a collaboration tool. It's like a, a business version of Dropbox. So as I say, uh, there'll be a theme of birds in this presentation because for some reason we've ended up with a duck as our mascot on our team. Um, and we do like things like rubber duck encoding, so like sort of to try and get things sorted out. But what do a tandem actually do? Uh, we are an actual digital bank. Uh, we launched, uh, I think, three years ago. Uh, we launched our first products two years ago, and we've got a, an iAndroid app, an iOS app. Um, and we're a fully licensed bank also. So we, deli we deliver two credit cards. Uh, we have also a savings. We have a feature called auto savings, which is great. I love it because I'm not really great with money, as probably quite a few people are. And we're obviously trying to bring the customer experience to the fore. We have an aggregation product, so you can bring all of your bank accounts into our app as well, which is really handy to give you a bit of a snapshot. Um, and also highlights and spending money as well, so you can see what you're actually doing. And this is what we may look like in the future. So this is a bit of a preview. Uh, what we're sort of doing is looking at how we're using our technology to really enhance the customer. So from here, you'll see mentions of debit, credit, and trying to bring all of those different product types, like loans, savings, into one particular universal product. So you get an understanding of what you're doing. And we're using um, MI and machine learning to really understand what you're doing. So where we really started at two years ago when I joined the organization, we were a bit of a web. So what we had was a bit of AWS. We had a bit of Azure. We had a bit of on-prem. That was where our production was. Um, 
we had also silo teams. We had the traditional infrastructure team. And we obviously had too many environments to deal with. So what we decided to do, there was the, the, what we wanted to do first off was actually condense our infrastructure team and the DevOps engineers that we had. And that the idea of that was to bring the DevOps knowledge, because there was some really good work being uh, done in the business with infrastructure as code, but our main production platform didn't really benefit. And then obviously we had the traditional infrastructure team, we merged them together, and they get, we brought out the platform team. So we got merge knowledge and skill set, and we, can really, we could really start to do the DevOps initiative as part of this modernization uh, plan that we had in place. So we had to pick um, an actual cloud platform to put all of our eggs into one basket and to really accelerate. So we used AWS, and for some of those services that we've got listed up on there, we could directly plug in. So we could use EC2 for our uh, main server technology. What we didn't want to do, and I haven't mentioned, is we did a lift and shift as well. So we could plug straight in. So RDS for databases, systems manager to manage the day-to-day. -day. Uh, low balancing, we used F5 technology, so we could plug straight into that. And the most important thing, we could use cloud formation. And this is kind of what it looked like at first. It, it, it looks at that web app database. Um, and it, you, know, it, you can recognize that probably from years gone by on how you would, in a classic way, deploy services um, with an web, a web front end and app back end services um, and database. And then obviously we had stuff in Azure as well for our uh, development um, environments as well. So it was a bit of a, you know, it was a bit chaotic. We had to have a mix and spread of uh, technology as well. So we decided to do the lift and shift project. We started this uh, back in January last year. Uh, so we were in Blue Chip Azure and we got the guys at NordCloud. They're a um, provider that helps businesses look at um, developing um, infrastructures, uh, like doing projects into the cloud. So we got three months worth of their expertise and we decided to go to AWS. And to do that, we needed to, a way of building our infrastructure and as code so we could repeat, repeatedly do it and we would get over some of the pains that we had um, when we had the on-prem infrastructure. So we decided to keep CloudFormation because uh, we had that e expertise in-house. We then also decided to use Ginger 2, which is a Python module, which allowed us to uh, use conditional, uh, conditional uh, triggers to be able to build our infrastructure just based on variables. So we didn't have to go into other technology sets. We had to move really, really fast and build those infrastructure stacks in AWS. And then along that, we also had some uh, knowledge already uh, in Bitbucket. We, we decided to use their pipelines feature um, and as part of that, we also used trunk-based development. So we didn't want long-lived infrastructure changes to live in, um, in code forever. We wanted to get to production as soon as possible. So we would make a change to that code, test it through our pipelines, um, and then release it into production. So we went from changes of hours and days into literally minutes. Um, so we would go from having one change and it will be in production within an hour. And that's what we're currently doing at the moment. And on top of that, because we, did, we had a lot of patching pain um, in terms of Windows, I'm sure a lot of you know in the Windows world, what we've decided to do is make our images repeatable as well. So we use Packer to build all of our images from the vanilla, vanilla image, so what AWS gave us and put all of the dependencies on there so we could deploy that really, really quickly. We could test through our development staging environments without too much pain and then go out into production. And the reason why we liked um, Pipeline's feature in Bitbucket, um, there's probably lots of different renditions of this now, but it allowed us to create uh, just simple lines of code in terms of building out different stages. So we do all of our, we put all our code through lint checks uh, and we also pass it through uh, CloudFormation lint checks as well. So we can check the code was ready to go before it even touched uh, a production environment. And on top of that, 
Uh, we already use New Relic on our on-premise environment and everywhere. So what the benefit of that was, we already plugged into their APM product, and we also used their Insights product to get some business data out. So what we had was some really good dashboards that we used on a daily basis, and when we did our changes from, to, from dev, staging, and prod, so we did it over a period of time, we could actually make sure we weren't hurting the customer. And on top of that, we could create dashboards to see how we actually got credit card applications coming through, we've got savings coming through, and where they're coming in through the flows as well. Because as a bank, we obviously have a lot of regulation and a lot of things we have to do in the back end to make sure we check the customer, we get them through our third-party systems who do much of our core banking, and get them to the end of that application process. So we wanted to see that 100% as close as we can at the very bottom for the complete applications. Now, there's other reasons why they might not get to the complete application straight away. So as part of that whole project, we started in um, the beginning of 2018, and we took the approach that we were just going to replace environments as we went through. So we worked with the engineers. Uh, we replaced uh, the dev environment, so we pushed our first ready environment for development environment in AWS in August. We got our staging environment in in uh, October, and we uh, then we then did our switch over of production at the back end of last year, uh, very very close to Christmas. So we wanted to get that done as soon as we can, and we did that within 12 hours. So we did a. We did a, a migration, um, obviously very, very nerve-wracking in the sense we had 300 gigs worth of uh, database data to move, but we used the development and the staging um, deployments to measure out how we were going to do that so, and go through all of the different stages. And here is a, a bit of a basic outlook. This is one of the first diagrams that I did um, to replicate what we had, as you saw earlier, with our on-prem to make sure that with the lift and shift product, product that we didn't change too much so engineers could understand what they were doing. And as a result, we had a 47% improvement in all of our APIs across the board. So as part of this whole iterative process of doing the lift and shift, we could move uh, quickly, we could scale quickly, uh, probably verti uh, vertically, to make sure that we didn't harm the customer. So we took that approach of not worrying too much about the cost, make sure that we could over-provision, and that we gave the customer the best experience. Now, for me, this is uh, the next bit is the more exciting bit. We're now moving into our phase two um, of our um, modernization journey, and we've kicked off our Penguin project. So I made a bit of a gaffe uh, the other week and said that um, penguins fly, they don't, they flap around <laughs> and go into the sea. Um, but it's arrived, we've spent six months already developing it, and we've got a couple of use cases already. Um, but where you could see the web, app, and database layers, what we needed to do was contextualize the services. So we did have microservices, but they were deployed monolithically on those services, but allow engineers to move fast but in a secure way, because we're a bank, we need to you know, look after our security, make sure our customers' data is secure and everything. So what we did is our chief architect created this, um, this thing called bounded contexts. Um, what we wanted to do was when we deployed new services, engineers could take a template and they could build all of the, what I would call the micro infrastructure very quickly into production. And the only two ways you could get access to that was a RESTful API or messaging, which is the, the function that the um, service could do to let other services know what was going on. And embedded in that, they could have what database they wanted what and making sure that we baked in encryption, and then they could build their microservices in a business context. So what does that look, what does that look like in reality? So you can see these two different contexts, context A and context B. Um, and those look slightly different, but the idea is, is that they could build quickly using what we were using already. So we were using Git, um, Bitbucket, and what we wanted to do is to allow them to create the infrastructure using a metadata file. So they could stay in plain English what they wanted, they could put all their service code in there, 
and it would go off to Jenkins. Um, and what we uh, decided to do was create some modules that would go through, um, and they could pick them up and deploy their, their new context using those modules. So it was, we're now starting to take the pressure off ourselves and allowing the engineers to build infrastructure. Um, and we've got a couple of those in play already. And then as you go through, we also have a module for creating the container, uh, the Docker container, and then that all comes together and builds the context. And from a higher level view, level view that's obviously at the back end this deals with, but some of those modules also deal with our front end. So we've come away from that web app and database, and we're now splitting our front end, so we're using our back end for front end approach, um, and we're using service discovery in this routing layer that links the API that other teams can go and build out, and they can go and contact context at the back end. And we are continuing to use New Relic. Um, we're, we decided strategically to go to .NET Core because we've got a lot of .NET experience. AWS is still at the core of that. And at the very end of that, we can monitor um, how we're doing and plug and play some of the existing features that New Relic have in the new world so engineers can understand through our transition what they're getting. And very quickly, we've already built out some of our dashboards to give us some very high level view of what's going on so we can work with engineers and go from there. So that's all in all, the end of phase two. And obviously, we want to reduce the amount of tools that we use. We want engineers to go faster. We want to be more secure. We want to template more things and build much more quicker so we can deliver more services to the customer and improve their experience. Thank you. <laughs>